Hi everybody, welcome back to Critical Mass. Paul and I are here and we just got back from Midway 2019. We gotta say 2019 because there was a you know 1976 version of this. But this is the remake and it's coming right around Remembrance Day. So it's out at the right time. Question is, is it a good movie? Well, we'll let you know right after this. Okay, Paul, I'm going to take a wild guess that you didn't see the 1976 version of Midway. That would be accurate. Because <laughs> you would have been what? Four? Three. Three. <laughs> so, yeah. I was a teenager, and back then, Midway was a big movie because it was the second movie to come out with what they called sen uh, sensorround sound, which is the, the sound that they came out with the movie Earthquake with Charlton Heston, that the big speakers in the front and it would shake when the earthquake hit. Well, the same thing for Midway, when the guns went off, it would shake in the audience. So it gave you that little extra effect. But apart from that, I've seen the movie numerous, numerous times, and now I've seen this one, but I'm gonna let you go as somebody who's never seen the old one. What did you think of this one? Uh, okay, well, let's, let's talk about the old one. This movie is not a sequel or a remake nope. of the old one. It's a completely different movie. But it's the exact same story. It, well, it's a historical event. Yes. But it has nothing to do with the first movie. No. Okay, good. This movie. Eh. <laughs> now, it was it was great compared to the movie we saw just before it. <laughs> yeah, but... You... <laughs> this was an Oscar contender compared to that movie. I could watch anything on Hallmark Romance TV, and it would have been better than what we saw last night in Playing With Fire. But that's another video. Check that one out. Now, if, if I had to wrap this movie up into a nice little package, I'd say great visuals, great acting, great actors, a very mediocre, jumbled, uh, hard-to-follow story. Here's one of the problems I have, and I think it's a problem in movies today, and that is... We have stars that we recognize now, like Woody Harrelson. But when we see Woody Harrelson now, we see Woody Harrelson. We don't see the character he's portraying. It's always Woody Harrelson well, acting in a movie. I get that, and I always feel that with Woody. Yeah. But when he walked on screen, I initially felt that, and then I said, wait a second, he, he's doing the role nicely, I like this. It did, but he's still, he, he's Woody Harrelson doing that role. Like, even his mannerisms and his faces, it looks back, it's Woody Harrelson. But did you feel that with Dennis Quaid? Yes. You did? I oh, did. Like, I didn't feel that with this movie. That's kind of the, like, if I took some of these guys and I put them in one of their other movies, I would not be able to tell which movie I'm watching other than the uniform they're wearing. Because they have the same acting all the way through. Where when you go back to the old movie, you have stars like Charlton Heston and Glenn Ford. When they were on screen, you knew who they were in there. They, they were big stars, but they could act in different movies. They weren't the same character in every movie. Well, no. Woody Harrelson was not Woody Harrelson in this movie. He played the part of an adult. He did, but his mannerisms and his facial expressions. And but his, that's his and face. His, <laughs> and his, but his jokes, like when he's... When he's, you knew that he's going to be that guy, and even when you look, not knowing anything about the history, you knew that in this movie, spoiler alert, by the way, here we go, when he's interviewing the other guy about intelligence, you knew he was going to take him. Uh, you knew he was, you, he was going to trust him no matter what. You knew he was going to stick up for him. There was no surprises, no. And, he, and he has that cocky, like... Yeah, we're going to do that, that Woody Harrelson look. Eh. Now, I think you probably... Who was it? Charlton Heston or Richard Chamberlain in the original 1976 Midway? Uh, it was Charlton Heston. Okay, so adults who were watching that movie probably felt the same way about Charlton Heston at the time. You were a teenager when you saw it, so you didn't have his whole history behind behind you to say, oh, this is just Heston hey, doing oh, his Heston except thing. Except he had just been in one of the biggest movies of the year that year, which was um, Planet of the Apes, a big sci-fi movie back then that the kids loved, including me. And when I saw this movie, I didn't think he was that astronaut from from there. I thought he was an admiral in the movie. Okay. The trouble I had in this movie is I couldn't remember who was who. Yeah. 
And I found that way when I was watching Dunkirk. Everybody looked the same. Well, you have you have all these flyboys. They're all dressed the same. They all have the buzz cuts. And they all talk the same. They, they all talk the same in that old, old-timey American accent. And you could tell they're acting that accent. Yeah. It wasn't natural. And in these kind of movies, especially this movie, they don't devote a lot of screen time to one particular storyline of, of a character to, to flush them out so they're memorable. They're, they have a whole bunch of different storylines with guys that look the same and sound the same, and so you're saying, okay, who is this guy again? One of the other problems I had, usually a musical score will build up a, a, an action scene. Star Wars, when they start riding in on the Death Star and that, the music is going, you feel pumped. In this movie, it was like slow, operatic, really like, dun, 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 dun. And meanwhile, shooting all over the place. And every, yet you don't even hear the real sound of the battle. It's more that really hard. And I know what they were getting for, going for. They were going for that feeling of when you're in that situation, everything slows right down and you become focused on what you're doing and you're you're battling through your own demons kind of thing. I know what they're going for, but it's an action movie. It's a World War II movie. It's a bombing mission. You, there's guns, bullets all over the place. Let me feel excited about it. Let me feel... In, I, at no point in this movie did I go, I wonder if he's going to make it. Hmm. At no point in this movie. And I didn't care who died. At the, I didn't care. Oh my God, what's happening to him? Uh, at one point... A guy gets tossed over by the Japanese Navy in with an anchor tied to his, and he drowns, and he's... I didn't care! No, there was no emotional Who connection. You? No, not at all. You know what I mean? And this is where I'll harken back to the other movie. There's a scene in that movie. In this scene, they tried to do the exact same thing. There's a plane. He hasn't come back after the last bombing mission on the Japanese carriers. In this movie... They basically did the opening scene of the movie and repeated it. Which we said, uh, I wonder if this is going to come into play at the end of the movie. Where he lands it without the engines and he just, he dips below and he comes up on the carry and just lands perfectly. And he comes up from the character and lands perfectly. No, oh, what's going to happen? No, is he shot? No, nothing. You just see the side shot of the plane going below the character, comes up and lands. And everyone goes, oh, yay, and they run over the character. In the original movie, it was Charlton Heston's son who was coming back. His cockpit had caught on fire. He was burning. They showed his whole face burnt. His hands were burning, and he was struggling to control the plane, and it came in. And, went, and, and you were going, is he going to make it? I don't know. And he crashes when he lands, and they run over and say, in this one, it was, oh, look, the hero made it. Yeah. The well, hero made it. There was no excitement. There was no excitement, but I guess this being a, a historical film, they're trying to get it as close to uh, what happened as possible. They can't, they can't dramatize it too much because this was a real guy. Dick Best was a real soldier. So if they're going to yeah. do a bunch of stuff, it has to be something that happened. That's fine. But I mean, give us something to cheer about. Give us something to care about. This guy was one of the most decorated people in World War II. And we didn't care. No, like, the only reason I remembered any of their names at the end of the movie was because they had this little sequence at the end where they showed the original person with their name beside it. And I said, oh, okay, that's who he was supposed to be. Yeah, and, 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 and that's, that's really disservicing to the, to the men of Midway. Because that was the turning point of the war. I think what they did for the war was fine. Every, everything was fine. It's just not executed properly. See, during the battle at one point when they finally struck the three Japanese carriers and they still had three carriers left and their Japanese only had one, they were, there was this big debate on whether they should draw at that point and they decided not to. They wanted that fourth carrier. And right at that point, that's when the Yorktown was attacked and struck. In this movie, all of a sudden Yorktown was on fire. We didn't see the Japanese retaliate. We didn't see them. We just said, okay, guys, here we go. We saw that. They're taken up. But we didn't see the actual attack on the Yorktown. We didn't see any of that part of the battle. We didn't see 
them, uh, you know, it, it just... But, okay, so for somebody who... I, I haven't studied uh, no. the Midway history, okay, but I have a good sense now after seeing this movie what took place. I don't need every single detail about what happened in the battle, the actual battles, to understand how Midway played out. I got the Pearl Harbor, I got the Doolittle Raid, and I got the, the, the ins and outs of how they lured the Japanese in. I got all of that. So I'm fine with that. I don't need every tiny little encyclopedic no. piece of minutia. I know, but what I'm saying is the stuff that they added in, I cared less, like the well, personal they, stuff that they just tried, drawn the movie out. They had to make some kind of connection with characters because you don't have a movie of just events. You have a movie with people. Yes. The trouble is, as you said, we didn't care about these no. characters. They did it. They did it poorly. Yes. Now... Things that we liked about the movie. I liked uh, how they explained the intelligence angle. I think the movie should have been more about the intelligence angle instead of uh, the battle angle. Uh, and I also liked how they showed the Japanese perspective. Because the person uh, who was playing uh, Yamamoto, yeah. uh, he was not only excellent in the role, but you really saw how uh, he didn't necessarily agree with what the Japanese government was uh, ordering him to do or their plans for the war. You saw how they had uh, uh, considerations about uh, oil resources and timing and uh, things weighed heavily on people on the Japanese side just as they did on the American side. So I thought it was awesome that the Japanese weren't just these uh, Nazi villainous empire yeah. type people. Well, and they could have even portrayed that a little more. Did you know ya Yamamoto's original plan for attacking Midway had eight aircraft carriers, not four, but Japanese high command wanted two diversions. So they took two carriers from, from here and two carriers from here and they sent them to different places to do diversionary attacks, hoping to draw away half the enemy fleet. And open up midway. Well, had they kept the eight carriers, there's no way the three American carriers would have been victorious. So in a way, Yamamoto, who was supposed to be the bad guy admiral, uh, was also somebody you cheered for, uh, the way they depicted uh, the Japanese perspective. Well, I don't know if you go so far as to cheer for him. Well, I, I was. <laughs> but you felt his, he wasn't a, a villain, he was following orders. But he, I wanted to see him on screen, and yeah. not because he was the evil bad guy, but because I, I actually felt a connection to his, his plight. Yeah. In fact, I felt more of a connection, unfortunately, to Yamamoto to the any American char character. And I'm also getting tired. Okay, for all my American friends. I'm getting tired that every single hero you have has to be a cowboy. Okay? <laughs> Stop it. They could be real people. They don't have to be smart aleck cowboys that just go off and do their thing and everything works out for them. Stop it. Because it didn't always happen right. <laughs> There's lots of dead cowboys out there. But you know what? The characters that the, the gentlemen they actually portrayed from this movie are real life heroes and we can't forget that. Now, you said visuals. One of the, the stark contrasts from the original film to this film movie is the original film used stock film footage from journalists and cameramen. So it was real action scenes from the battle that they would show in the movie. So it was grainy and, you know, a little bit thick, but it, all the explosions and everything were real. Everything in this movie is CGI. And at some time, at some point, but it also they, when they showed the bombing of Pearl Harbor in the original movie, it was full length models that they set up and they would have the torpedoes coming in and you could see the cameras all lined up in the water uh, off the side and little rowboats and things like that. You could see the torpedoes heading full length models. So it was real things. It wasn't green screen, right? It was practical effects. And this movie was pretty much 100% green screen effects. Mm -hmm. There were times where you could tell, okay, those planes are kind of flying too close together or uh, I'm sorry, with the amount of flak in the air, every single one of those planes would be toast. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was, I think it was overdone, uh, but uh, I, it was still visually pleasing to me. It all looked so overdone. Again, green screen just doesn't look as good as practical effects. 
The Star Wars movies prove that. But I'm not going to bag on this film for anything that I saw on screen because I thought it was all, like, it was amazing. Although I did, I did catch scenes where they copied scenes from previous scenes from different, from the same bat, like, the same scene of die bombing, all of a sudden they're die bombing a second carrier, yet it's the same exact cut scene. Copy paste. Copy paste. I saw that a few times in the film and I, I like it clear as day, I picked it out and I went, uh, come on, somebody should edit that a little better than that. Uh, this is a big budget Hollywood film. But apart from that, if the soundtrack would have been better, I probably would have liked this movie more. It really would. Had I remembered a single character, I might have liked this a little bit more. I know Admiral Halsey, I know Nimitz, I, I used to study all that stuff. And I'm looking at these actors going, who is, was he Nimitz, was he Halsey? I, I don't remember, I don't know. So, uh, my verdict, because I didn't really have any kind of emotional connection to anything that was happening on screen or to any character, I'm going to give this movie a five. Yeah, Had, just, take, just take the score of the soundtrack away and it might have been a six but yeah five it's a so-so movie it's unfortunate because this is the kind of a movie we did a thing a little while ago about movies we would like to see remade and I said Battle on the Bulge because I knew Midway was already being remade and now I saw this and I went no I, I saw, it was too raw raw and too I don't know who anyone is and I should, because I know every single real person that was talked about in this movie. But I could not remember which character was playing that person, other than the intelligence officer. Hmm. And that was it. Because he was the only one who looked anything different. And you know why? He wore glasses. <laughs> he was the only one who wore glasses. Yeah. And that's why I also know the actor. But... That's the only different, but we remembered him. As soon as he came on, comes on screen, even if he's way off in the distance, that's the intelligent officer. When the other guys are on the aircraft carrier coming out, we're going, I don't know, they're pilot. Uh, there's someone of the pilots. Oh, oh, that's the guy from Alita. I can't remember anything that he's doing in this movie, but I know he's the guy from Alita. Yeah, and wait, is he the, the guy who's a jerk to him, or is he friends with him? Yeah. I, like, they had so many of these things that he's a jerk and we're betting them and he's a cocky guy and he's not a cocky guy and I, why isn't he being promoted and all of a sudden he's promoted and no one knows and not, nothing was said about being promoted but all of a sudden he's promoted. Come on, write better scripts. <laughs> all right, five out of ten. Unfortunately, this was not a great weekend for movies. No. For us. Luckily for you, you have Frozen 2 coming up which you get to see. I'm on, a, on the road. I hope maybe I can see it on one of my days between cruises, but how bad is it for Hollywood that Frozen 2 is my most anticipated movie for the end of the year? That's pretty sad. Well, you called it at the beginning of the year. I did. When we said most anticipated movies, you said Frozen 2. And I, I think I'm right. 100%. Not Star Wars, not another superhero movie. Frozen 2. Sad.